Chapter 22, September 27, 1793. Yesterday, the worst day yet, even those who are not sick have eyes tinged with yellow. More doctors are ill and dying. Dr. Benjamin Rush, Letter 1793. It hit me all at once. My fears about mother, the fever, Bush Hill, watching grandfather die, being scared, alone, and hungry. I cried. I cried a river, and poor Eliza did her best to comfort me. The kinder her words, the harder I cried. When I finally paused to catch my breath, she had one question. Why aren't you with your mother at the farm? What do you mean? I asked. Mother didn't come to the farm with us. We never got there. Oh dear, said Eliza. She looked around at the deepening shadows. We can't stay here. You are coming with me to my brother's. You can tell me what happened as we walk. Eliza pulled her companion aside and spoke quietly. The woman looked at me with an arched eyebrow and walked away. Am I taking you away from your work? I asked. Do you need to help your friend? It's time for all of us to be safe at home, said Eliza. She pulled a roll from her basket. Is this little one hungry? Nell snatched the roll without a word and took a huge bite. That's a good answer, said Eliza. She laid her hand on Nell's forehead and neck. I don't think she has the fever, I said. I hesitated. I didn't want Nell to hear me discuss her mother. She's alone. Eliza nodded. We have to hurry, she said. Do you want me to carry her? Nell tensed and locked her arms around my neck. I would have gratefully delivered her to Eliza, but I didn't think my neck would survive. I'm fine, I lied. Eliza led me down back streets as I briefly explained what had happened since Grandfather and I left the coffee house. I skipped the hardest parts, being alone with Grandfather's body, lying in Bush Hill, the robbers. I didn't want to cry in front of Nell. Eliza didn't say anything. She shook her head and hurried me along until we reached the narrow street where she lived. Her brother Joseph was a cooper. He made barrels a good trade. Eliza lived with Joseph's family in a small apartment above the cooperage. I stopped at the bottom of the stairs. I had to know. I covered Nell's ears. Where's mother? She's dead, isn't she? She's dead and you're trying to shield me from it. Eliza put a hand on her back and stretched. No, no, she's not dead. Don't think that for a minute. Last I saw her, she was recovered from the fever and bent on following you to the farm. The knot at the base of my neck loosened. I must go there, then. I have to find her, Eliza. Hush. You can only climb one mountain at a time. Come upstairs and eat some dinner. We'll think better with full bellies. I promise I'll tell you all I know. She led me up the stairs to a small set of rooms, dimly lit but clean-smelling and orderly. Joseph's wife died last week. Eliza whispered as we paused in the doorway. He mourns her something terrible. He is still in bed recovering. He's weak, but he'll survive. Thank the Lord the boys haven't taken ill. Plump-cheeked twins stormed Eliza as soon as she crossed the threshold. These are the boys. She hugged them tightly before disentangling herself from four arms. We have company, she said. This is Maddie, my friend from the coffee house, and Maddie's little friend Nell. Maddie, this is Robert, and this is William. The boys peered shyly at me, then hid their faces in Eliza's skirts. Nell mimicked them, hiding her face in my neck. If I didn't set her down soon, my arms were going to snap off at the shoulder. Is that you, Eliza? A tiny woman, leaning on a cane, slowly made her way into the room. Snow-colored hair framed a deeply lined face the color of aged mahogany. She looked to be the oldest person I'd ever seen. The woman walked straight to me and poked my arm. Who's this? she demanded. As Eliza explained, the older woman harumphed and snorted. So you've got to feed them too? she asked. No, ma'am, Eliza doesn't have to feed me, I protested, although that's exactly what I was hoping Eliza would do. We came across each other in the course of our errands. I'll need to go home soon, and now... I wasn't sure how to end that sentence. The old woman shook her head. You don't leave until you've eaten. I've seen brooms with more meat on them. The stew is hot, Eliza, and you still have bread and turnips. I'll come again in the morning. She turned in the doorway and pointed a finger twisted with work and age at the boys. No trouble from you two. Let your papa sleep and mind Eliza, or I'll send a ghost after you. The boys stared with wide eyes and nodded. The old woman chuckled as she walked out, her cane heavy on the floor. I'll stop by tomorrow. We'll see if the wagon from Lidditz comes on time. Never thought the day would come when I wished I worked on a farm again. Her voice faded as she made her way down the street, one slow step at a time. The boys stared at the closed door. That was Mother Smith, Eliza told me. Don't worry, children. She won't send any ghosts. Who wants to
to help me with Papa's supper. The stew in the kettle was made for four, not six. Eliza ladled out a full portion into my bowl, but I poured half of it back. I don't need all of this, Eliza. The boys should eat so they don't take sick. She looked at me closely. Hmm, she said. Could be, you're right. She took a bowl of soup into her brother Joseph and let me at the table with the children. Nell let me unwind her from my neck when she realized a bowl of soup was for her. She sat on my lap and stared at Robert and William. They slurped up their soup and stared back. I thought they might be close to the same age. A plan began forming in my mind, but I quickly shushed the thought. I didn't have time to dream or plan. I would deal with each hour as it came, one step at a time. The bustle of the family's evening, clearing away, washing up, getting the boys ready for bed, pushed away all the thoughts of the fever for a few hours. Nell fell asleep in my lap shortly after dinner and did awake when I laid her on a soft quilt that Eliza spread on the floor. When the boys were finally asleep and Joseph was resting comfortably, Eliza set two chairs by an open window, handed me a mug of lemonade, and motioned for me to sit down. I told the cook it was time for the truth. You stay right there on that chair until you tell me what happened. Everything. I never could keep anything from Eliza. The story slid out with all the details. Being abandoned on the road, struggling to care for Grandfather, getting the fever, the garden, the intruders, Grandfather's death. Talking about him brought back the tears. I did everything wrong, Eliza. I couldn't make a decent meal for Grandfather. I knew he wasn't well. His face was so red. I should have done something. Chased the intruders out, or better yet, not been such a baby and left the shutters open just because I was hot. It was all my fault. Eliza handed me a clean handkerchief and patted my hand until my sobs quieted. Your grandfather was a wise man. You couldn't have saved him, Maddie. It was his time. I sniffed and took a shaky breath. What happened after he died? She asked. I filled in the rest of the story quickly. This strange day that began with a burial and ended with a homeless child in my arms. Eliza watched Nell sleeping. She lay curled on her side, clutching her headless doll. You understand that she needs to go to the orphan house, don't you? You should probably go there yourself. My stomach tightened. Please, Eliza, don't make me go. I know you think I'm a child, bigger than Nell, but a baby still, and that I need someone to tell me to wash my face and finish my bread. I struggled to control my voice. I'm not. I'm not a little girl. I can take care of myself. We'll talk about it in the morning. We'll talk about everything in the morning. Eliza rubbed her shoulders and stretched her neck. Do you feel ill? Do you want to lie down? I asked. I'm just tired, and I can't sleep yet. A woman's work is never done. Isn't that what the fools say? Here, she pulled a small pair of pants out of a basket at her feet and rummaged for a needle and spool of dark thread. Robert and William are harder on their clothes than any dock worker I've ever seen. Stitch up the rips while I try to put this shirt back together. I'll tell you what I've been doing. I bit off a length of thread and slid it through the eye of a needle as Eliza talked. A few weeks ago, Dr. Benjamin Rush wrote to Reverend Allen asking for help. Reverend Allen from the Free African Society? The same. The doctors thought us Africans couldn't get yellow fever. Reverend Allen said this was a chance for black people to show that we are every bit as good and important and useful as white people. The society organized folks to visit the sick, to care for them, and bury them if they died. Eliza's voice drifted off as she caught a memory. She took a deep breath and picked her selling up again. Is that why you were visiting those homes this morning? Eliza nodded. Yes. Mother Smith takes my place minding the boys and Joseph. The society has done a remarkable job, and I don't mind saying that with pride. The Africans of Philadelphia have cared for thousands of people without taking notice of color. If only the doctors had been right, we could look to these days of suffering as days of hope. I stuck the needle in my thumb. What do you mean, if only the doctors had been right? Eliza held up the sh- held the shirt up to the light to check the even- evenness of the stitches. After a few weeks of nursing the sick and burying the dead, our own people started to sicken. Black people can get sick with a yellow fever, just like white people or Indians. I do know some who have never been sick, but there are white people who could say the same thing. We stitched in silence, each, de- each deep in thought. Are we going to die, Eliza? I asked finally. Eliza snorted. That's foolish talk. I'm not going to die. I have too much work to do. Mother Smith there, she won't go until she's ready, and the Lord himself asks for the pleasure of her company. Don't listen to words of despair, Maddie. You must be strong and have faith. When will it end? 
for everything there's a season, remember? When the frost comes, the fever will vanish. We just have to find a way to make it until then.